pleasure to be here. As I said, I'm here through an EBI funded ambassador grant, which I was able to win this year, and I uh, uh, was a, it was a, uh, it enables me to come over here to give some training and outreach for this today's uh, final two day workshop. So I thought I'd end it on a on a on a little presentation about big data because this is a real important topic for today in bioinformatics and for the future. So if you're not aware of uh, big, what big data is, I should give you a little bit of an introduction. Big data is like uh, huge amounts of data that makes it very difficult to manage and to analyze and I'm going to give uh, a, you a brief overview of some of the technical aspects of this. So as I said this might be a bit too technical for most of the audience but um, at least you'll be aware of some of the, uh, the challenges and solutions that are there available for us in the field of bioinformatics. So uh, these, this are the three main points in my talk. I'm going to talk about um, huge data growth, uh, bioinformatics, the technical considerations and the limitations and solutions that we have available to us. So first about the huge data growth. Um, so you're probably aware of this already but there's been a great deal of technological advancements uh, over the last 10, 15, 20 years to do with biological experiments. So that has meant that uh, the cost to do these experiments have has gone down greatly over time. For example, uh, genome sequencing. So, but this, this has been applied to all areas of biological research. So genomics, proteomics, uh, the list goes on and on, all areas basically. And so this means, uh, since all the experiments are cheaper, that means more laboratories are performing these experiments and more and more data every year are being generated. So I mentioned the cost of genome sequencing. So if you're uh, maybe familiar with something about computer science, you might have heard something called Moore's Law. And this sort of is, is more of a guideline that talks about how uh, like the cost of, of the processing power doubles every two years. Well, if we were following Moore's Law since 2001, uh, it was predicted that, that that straight line was going to be the, uh, the cost of genome sequencing in the future. But in, if you see the, the dotted uh, green line instead, is there was the actual uh, cost. It fell down massively in around 2007, 2008. This was mainly due to high throughput sequencing, new technologies that were invented uh, that, was, uh, that, that came with, uh, that meant uh, these experiments were actually at a very low cost to perform. So the, the, the cost fell steeply and over time now in 2015, this slide was taken from the NIH website, it costs about one and a half thousand US dollars to genome someone's sequence or a genome the sequence someone's genome. So that might be quite a lot of money in ringgit because the exchange rate is quite poor at the moment, so one and a half times by four point four and you add GST as well, that's quite a lot of money. And if you think about the, the median wage in, in Malaysia is maybe a thousand something ringgit a month. So that's for a Malaysian that might be quite a lot of money, but for if you're dealing in US dollars for in a typical US income, it's actually a lot less money than it looks like. And in the future, this is even just 2015 today, what about 2017, 2035, 2050? The cost is going to go down and down and down. Um, so we have huge data, not just uh, proteomics, as I mentioned, that's my background, but also uh, other areas which are huge data like genome sequencing. So I should mention, if you don't know about the EBI, so I'm from the European Molecular uh, biology laboratories, uh, that's my parent organization and in fact I'm part of the European Bioinformatics Institute. We're on an outstation of EMBL and we're based in Cambridge in the UK and we are Europe's hub for biological data services and research. So we are all about uh, managing data and disseminating data. So this is like an arrow of, of biological research. So we, we are, the EBI is involved in everything from genome sequencing, nuclear sequencing, uh, protein sequencing, proteins, protein structures, chemical entities, protein-protein interactions, chemical pathways, biological pathways, whole model systems, non-model organisms. Basically everything to do with biological data, we were involved in it. So we collect data from laboratories from all over the world that wish to disseminate their data because we believe in a very open practice to share it with the community. This is what drives science forward. 
And this, I hope this graph has come out quite well. Yes, this is um, a data, uh, ex a sort of a data explosion graph because this is a logarithmic scale on the y axis. So uh, a straight line here would indicate a uh, doubling of, of, of data growth every year, but as you can see, and the, sorry, the dash lines are different orders of magnitude. So, uh, for instance, if you see, where is it now? The microarray data is in bright green, if you can see. That has sort of steadily, uh, had a steady climb um, over the last uh, 10 years. But if you look at other, the other graphs, the, um, where is it now? The red graph at the top, that's the raw sequencing data. That has jumped up orders of magnitude, about four or five, over the last 10 years. And similarly, uh, when I deal with proteomics data, that's the light blue color over here. We've, we have gone from orders of, um, we've gone up four or five orders of magnitude as well. And as I said, if you just look in the last few years at the far uh, right of the graph, we still have uh, a steadily increase on, on every single one of our different data type resources. So even now today, um, if you compare our data from last year, we have literally doubled the amount of data. And, and it's predicted next year we're going to double again. So that's not, not, that's not increasing at the same uh, uh, amount as previous years. We are increasing uh, our data capacity every single year. This has tremendous strain on our computer infrastructure. So for bioinformaticians, uh, this, this huge amount of data has very big problems for us. So uh, first of all, uh, I should mention that when bioinformaticians want to look and analyze data, you now have to process and analyze over really huge data sets. So now you have a wealth of information available for you. Uh, you have a lot of processing that needs to be done over a lot of data. So apart from processing over this data, you're now generating your own data. You're, you're, you're generating huge files or maybe downloading other people's files. So you have to store these, these huge files. You have to share them with other people. And, uh, and now since new technologies have, been, have evolved and companies have made different um, instruments, there's different data types, heterogeneous data types. And as well, if you want to compare the, the data quality, heterogeneous data quality between older data, newer data, data from different instruments. So there's different types of data to describe the same thing. And your software analysis has to cope with all of this. So I'd like to then explain to you a bit about the technical considerations about how you deal with big data. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> so uh, infrastructure has to be up to scratch. So when I talk about infrastructure, I mean the computer hardware that runs the software for your analysis or storing your data. So that includes things like file transfer bandwidth, so if you're transferring your files from one place to another place or from a collaborator to you or from a public repository to you. Um, file storage capacity, so say at the EBI, we need to be able to hold everyone's data in the world. Uh, or if you want to download our data for your reanalysis, you need enough storage space to download all the data. And then computing power as well. So, I mean, uh, you need really fast uh, computer uh, CPU processors, uh, enough like, memory to, to cope if you're doing analysis over uh, a large amounts of data. So, in, 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 to summarize that, when I talk about computing power, uh, computing analysis to be doing less and less on local hardware. When I say local hardware, I mean like the computer or the laptop in front of you. These machines, they're, they're modern, they might be modern, yes, but in relative terms, they're not actually very powerful. So it might work for small data sets or trivial tutorial examples that we did in today's workshop, if, if you were attending. Uh, but even then, it took maybe a few minutes to process through, and maybe that's, and that's just involving a few example files. When you're re do, when you're dealing with real data, which is, as I said, is getting larger and larger in size and from other people, uh, your, your laptop or your computer at your desk isn't going to be able to cope. You need to run these software, your analysis, analysis pipelines, or somewhere else, which I'm going to explain shortly. So an example of where you would run uh, software analysis would be on a traditional server farm. So when I say a server farm, I mean 
a like you might have heard the terms like computer cluster. So that means a collection of like big server, big machines that are really powerful that are running in maybe uh, in a special server room that that are very that are there for high performance computing. So at the EBI we have a server farm like this, which is called a platform load sharing facility, or LSF for short. So on this LSF we have what's called uh, processing nodes, and these are essential, uh, essentially uh, like computers that have specific hardware like uh, CPU, RAM allocated to them that can process people's uh, analysis. <clears throat> and in order to do this, uh, to process the analysis, they have to read data in and write data out. So data is read in through something called a network file system, NFS for short saying this is our own implementation uh, in order to deal and read in huge amounts of data easily across the whole network and then write it out to where we need to write it to. And all this is managed by what's called a job scheduler. Uh, so different people from different teams will, sum will want to run their analysis. They submit their job to what's called a job scheduler and that will put it in a queue and when uh, resource is free on the network it will uh, send the, the job across for it to be executed on the processing nodes. And all this might be, have to be managed by an enterprise level database. What I mean is it needs to be robust and production level ready. So things like Oracle or MySQL or PostgreSQL, uh, they're very popular. So this is a, a topology, a simple topography diagram about uh, the LSF that we have at the EBI. Uh, so again, this is sort of the overview of our cluster. So I don't know if this, this come out very well, but here, imagine if I'm a biopartition and I want to run my analysis. I submit my job to the job scheduler, it gets queued, and then will get executed on the resource, on the processing nodes, and will maybe update databases, read in files, do some analysis, and then when it's finished, it'll write an output file or summary file, results, and then the resource is finished, my job is finished, I've got my results. So this is, to, this is generally how biopartitions are now uh, analyzing their data. It's not necessarily on their own computer because they have so much requirements that are needed from their computer hardware. So apart from um, a traditional approach like LSF that we have at the EBI, you may have heard about cloud computing. And this is sort of a new thing that's come around in the last 10 years as well that will hide all the complexity of a normal traditional server farm. So one particular vendor you might have heard of is Amazon Web Services, AWS for short, and they allow you to uh, buy a processing time from them and process your jobs in the cloud. So I want to do my analysis, I can send it to the AWS in the cloud on the internet somewhere, and it hides all the complexity from me, and it will take care of it. So something like processing in the cloud is something called AWS Elastic Compute Cloud, EC2. Or I uh, mentioned before, in the LSF, we have like the network file system, so our, the file system on our network. But in the cloud, you can have cloud file systems. You might have heard of like Dropbox or like Google Drive. That's like a cloud storage system. So Amazon have like a, a like a good like enterprise level, like a company type level uh, storage it's called uh, Simple Storage Service S3. Also, you can have databases in the cloud too, not just files and the processing, but databases that are used for updating records and uh, saving extra information. And you can have Oracle cloud databases or MongoDB databases. Again, these are all modern and, uh, and very, can interface very well to other cloud services. So I show you that the previous LSF network diagram was a little bit complicated, whereas with the cloud, as, as I mentioned, it takes away the complication. This is sort of what you end up with. You have your terminal, your computer, your laptop, you submit your job to the cloud, and it takes, takes care of the rest, that's it. It hides the complexity from you. Um, so I, I should mention something about, uh, I'll move on to about the limitations and solutions that um, that are inherent to the using computer resource like this. So, uh, when you have, when you're wanting to do analysis and the software are going to be run either say on a normal server farm or in the cloud, you need to have technical expertise 
in your bank petitions in order to harness the power of your computing resource. Uh, I mentioned that like for instance, you have a computer cluster available with really fast CPU and a lot of RAM and a lot of uh, disk space. Well, in order to maximize the potential you have, you need to have well-qualified people to take advantage of the resources available to them. So that means a really well-programmed software pipelines or perhaps updating existing pipelines that might be open source that you could edit yourself in order to maybe parallelize some tasks. That means to um, split up the task maybe into small portions that can execute at the same time that might give you overall better performance and that means you get your results faster or you can process over bigger data in a more timely fashion. So um, apart from the uh, so having good bind petitions to uh, exploit good uh, resources that are available to them you need to also have good administers so when you're having a computer server file you need good uh, administers to take care of the, of the computer cluster. That means to increase storage when it needs to be increased, uh, adding new processing nodes when they need to, replacing old hardware that dies, um, and all that comes with it. So in order to keep the, uh, the, server, the server farms ticking so everyone can use it uh, on demand as they need to for their research. But this, this, kind of, this can be sort of offset, it said if you had a cloud implementation, there's only cloud administration that is needed. So it said, apart from a cloud infrastructure taken with complexity of you, you don't know how it's being run or the, the, the topography about how the process nodes are set up, and the administration also basically is taken all the way from you. It's all taken care of by a company instead. So that when you, when, when uh, realize, when considering these two different types of approaches to, that's a big computing, uh, you should, the, there's a big financial cost. If you want to set up and administer your own computer cluster versus buying some other company's cloud uh, solution instead. So a cloud solution might be cheaper in the short term, but you tend to get billed per second of you've used it. So in the long term, uh, if you have lots of analysis that you're going to be doing, it's probably less cost effective than making your own server farm and administering yourself if you're going to be using it all the time. So other limitations I mentioned in one of my slides was about data transfer. So in today's, um, in, in today's bioinformatics analysis, you often need to transfer data from one site to another site. So you might want to download data from me at the EBI in Cambridge in the UK, or you might need to download your data from collaborators in the US. So the normal way of doing this, you might have heard of something called FTP, File Transfer Protocol. This has been around for decades, but it is actually very slow and unreliable over large geographical distances. And it, that might be an option to you, but it might not be a practical one. And instead, I would recommend that people use something else. Uh, for example, a grid FTP server. This is quite similar in fashion, but it uh, has, it's more federated, you can, sorry, it's more managed. It's like if I have a grid FTP at EBI and you have a grid FTP here in Padana, you can tell your grid FTP to download from mine and it will happen in the background over, say, a week or two or something. Um, other solutions apart from FTP, there's something called UDP. Uh, a company has, has developed very good technology that's free for users to, well, for people to use called Aspira. Uh, this is a type of technology that is used all across the world. They've won actually awards, including Emmys even. Uh, for doing this because it's very popular in the media industry in America, especially if you've heard something called Netflix, uh, that's the, like number one like you know, film streaming and movie streaming in, in America. It, it's about 50% of all internet traffic in America today and that uses Aspira. It is a very important piece of technology uh, that, as I said, is free for end users uh, to have. Of course, you have to pay a small licensing fee if you're a server. So, but at the EBI, we have a Spira service, so people could download from us using a Spira, for example. This is how we're trying to offer a good uh, service for users who want to download a lot of data, and I recommend it. Um, I mentioned about cloud, uh, cloud computing just before and cloud storage. Well, actually, say if you had a collaborator with their cloud uh, infrastructure and you wanted to move the data to your cloud, which is separate, cloud to cloud transfer is actually very slow because they basically do an FTP transfer. So it's, if you have a lot of data that needs to transfer with collaborators in the cloud, it's really not a good solution. 
Uh, also, there's another consideration about security. So at the EBI, generally, we have free access to public data, it's, uh, and, and we don't have to worry about security so much. But if you're performing research and with unpublicized data, uh, you need to have good security in place in order so uh, you're, not, you're not hacked in by uh, criminals and anyone else who's after your research data. Um, I just want to also mention a few other solutions uh, that are real life that, that have emerged from pilot projects. Uh, the first I wanted to mention would be about the Embassy Cloud. So uh, this Embassy Cloud comes from uh, a group called Elixir, which is also the, the based at the EBI, which is a pan-European infrastructure for life sciences. So it's a, it's a multinational corporation in order to share biological uh, resource. And they've set up something called an Embassy Cloud. So that means uh, an end user client could purchase time in our Embassy Cloud and execute their processing on our computer resources. So that means you can use our LSF through a secure, your secure access, and this would, uh, have, would enable you to run your compute, your analysis on our resource, on our data. This would have the benefits for you because then you don't need to download our data. You don't need to transfer it across. You don't need to store it and then process it over your own computer infrastructure. Instead, you give us your analysis software and, and we run it for you. So that means your costs are a lot uh, lower uh, in order to run, do the same thing if you're, if you're wanting to run stuff on our data. So this is a little topography diagram about that. So you're, you connect through, through the internet, go through the EBI firewall, and your embassy cloud runs there on our computer processing nodes against our databases on our data files. Um, and so this, that was about that sort of an example of how you can um, implementation for, for running your analysis. So I know you, um, other places are mainly involved with not doing analysis, but also generating the samples. Big laboratories are now uh, wanting to manage all of their samples. I know from the, the Welcome to Sanger Institute that shares the same campus at the EBI, they use a system called IRODS, which is, raw, which is called Raw Oriented Dom Data Management Systems. So they, use, they do use this system because they, have, they generate so many samples and, run, and have to uh, generate so much data from that many samples that they need a very robust system to track all the samples. And for them, it fulfills a very key role. So this is a little diagram about um, the iRod's topography. So they have like what's called an iCAT server, which sort of manages everything and records all the metadata for, uh, for a sample that gets prepared, like the species name, uh, the scientists who performed the experiment, what the experiment was. And that metadata, that data about data, is added to the sample, and when that sample is has generated this data, it is put in a certain place so everyone knows where the data are and how they can they can find the data or move the data around as they need to. As I said, the Sang have a big uh, sort of problem to overcome with this because they have so many, they run so many experiments every day. Uh, finally, also I'd like to also mention the uh, Nebula Cloud. This is something, the EMBL, so that's the, uh, the main um, <coughs> uh, European like a body lab itself, not at the EBI. This is from Heidelberg in Germany. They have come up with something called the uh, Helix Nebula. So in their labs, they have their say next generation sequencing labs that run and produce their huge data. And for them, it, the data directly goes to the Nebula cloud. And then scientists can uh, log into that cloud, maybe see an overview and click a button to then start the processing to the next step in order to get their results. So this is sort of integrating a cloud service with their laboratory. So uh, one last thing before I, I end my talk, I also want to mention about open source benefits. So if you're not familiar with open source uh, software or programming, this is a concept that means every, that it's free, free to access, the code is available free for contribution from anyone in the world. So everything is open, there is no licensing costs. And this brings tremendous benefits when it comes to bioinformatics research. Uh, three main areas, uh, transparency, efficiency, 
and for the community. So when I talk about transparency and open source software are free, this means that the analysis, the algorithms that are used are open, you know exactly what's going on. This means so the analysis that how, and how the results are, are obtained uh, from your data uh, is all publicized. So you know what's happening and you can prove your results through these open source methods. So also, uh, efficiency is a key win when it comes to open source software. Um, expertise can be drawn from many people from around the world. So if I make some software myself and I keep it closed, it might not be very good, but if I share it with everyone else, other experts and perhaps researching similar things can look at my algorithm and improve it because they because it's no longer mine anymore. It's open for the community. It belongs to everyone. So I mentioned the community. So uh, bioinformatics, just like many areas of science, it's a very collaborative effort. So that means projects evolve uh, from different teams, different people contributing in order to grow and, and can become something more meaningful. You might have heard of things like um, R and Bioconductor. They started as very small projects. And then eventually people wanted more, got involved more and more and it became a very popular resource today. That can happen not just with something as big as our bioconductor, but anything in bioinformatics, whatever software is made, whatever service is made available. If they are open source, that means the community can greatly benefit from everyone's expertise. So in summary, hopefully I've given you, I know it's quite technical and you might not be that interested in computer science side of things, but at least I've given you now an overview of that there's no one big magic pill to solve big data problems in bioinformatics. There's so many different complexities to take into account about the, the data size and the data complexities that you have to take into account in order to analyze your data and maybe reanalyze uh, other people's data to uh, progress with your research. But there are ways, as mentioned, by the LSF or cloud computing and the IRL systems to really manage samples, manage pro data processing, and how data can be transferred, like with Aspera. So, also, I'd like to, my, my one final point is that all of this, uh, with the areas of bioinformatics and data research explode, and data explosion, this is really going to affect, in my opinion, uh, personalized medicine and uh, for, for healthcare in the future. If, as I said, the cost of gen genome sequencing has gone down to one and a half thousand uh, US, do US dollars uh, for today. But uh, we might have a day, maybe 10 years, 20 years, when you go to a, for a consult and you're going to get your genome sequenced there and then, and your doctor will give you your results there and then. Or you might have um, a proteomics analysis done on blood during consult there and then, and, here, here, and then your doctor has the results there and there during the, the, uh, the consult. So imagine that's just one consultation for one person, and this generates lots of data. How about throughout someone's lifetime, how much health data is going to be generated, and how much uh, so you need to store this securely, and then how about the research that needs to be done across everyone's genomes or everyone's proteome uh, 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 samples. It's going to be a very big problem for healthcare in the future, especially not just biological research. Okay, thank you for your time. Uh, if you want to read more about big data, I've written down a few of these uh, uh, publications that, you know, that describe the problem very well. Read more about Elixir and Amnesty Cloud. And if anyone has any questions, uh, please put your hand up and then I'll try and answer them as best I can. for the embassy cloud. You, you need to sort of talk to us and arrange access because in order to do that you need to use something called like a virtual machine to upload so your own your op own operating system image to run your analysis. And this is a paid for service, it's not freely available. But I I'm pretty sure there's trials involved if you're actually interested in, in using it though. Um, I 
would like to get an idea of uh, e EPML, is it? So which one, sorry? The EPML, EPML. yes. Uh, who are involved in, uh, other than Cambridge and are there any in Asia or is it just a European? Area? Okay, so EMBO, so that's the European Molecular Biology, um, Molecular Biology Laboratories. So uh, EMBO member states are across Europe mainly. So that's UK, Ireland, Germany, France, Spain, etc. And we have uh, one associate member state that's actually Australia. So actually no, nothing to do with Europe, but they're still wanting to partner with us for bioinformatics research because they think they don't have any great uh, partners out in their own continent on their own. So they have to partner with the chosen EMBL. But also, I mentioned the Elixir group, which is sort of a pan-European wide organization to do pretty much the same thing, but EBI is part of it still. So for the Elixir member states, I believe there's a few outside of Europe that are, are wanted to become members. They're called associate members. They're like, I think South Africa, I think India, and maybe a couple of others from outside of Europe as well. Uh, I, I've heard that there's sort of like a like a trial a trial um, partnership. I said this associate status. So that means that these countries don't need to put up any money, but they can become sort of acting members. It's like a try before you buy. You can I think they become members for maybe two or three years, and then see about our future resources, our infrastructure see if they like it or not, and if they do, they want to become full members, then they need to pay a membership fee to keep their membership. Otherwise, they can part ways, and they don't need to be members anymore. Anyone else? Yes, uh, Siti. Yeah, so in that the, the nebula before, so imagine so you ran your experiment in the laboratory and the instrument automatically puts it into the nebula cloud and then when you log in to let's say a website like a web form, you can see your data has been generated and then you've already got your like just your processing pipeline set up and then it's all ready to go with new input data. You can say, okay, these gen the, the raw data looks good, I can click something and I'll start my processing. Then I'll start the processing and I'll finish the process, you'll get your results. And I'll output it to a certain directory and then you can look at your results to then, um, what's the word, check whether they're good or bad. So you might have a different set of tools to look at the data or to try and check the quality of the data. So it's like I said, it's like Nebula Cloud's meaning to try and automize um, managing your data files and putting it into your software pipeline, the, the, your software workflow. Yes. Um, I, uh, you mentioned that uh, you have a service for structure-based virtual screening, uh, for? such as uh, molecular docking for drugs. Yes, so uh, one big project from the Elixir group is something called the CCTV, no, CTTV, sorry. <coughs> The Center for Therapeutic, uh, like value, value to validation or something. I'm sorry, I'm not involved in the project myself, but I've heard about it, and it's to do with repositioning drug targets. So we've been partnering with uh, in with companies in the industry like AstraZeneca, big pharmaceutical companies, really, in order to try and find new targets for existing drugs. So apparently, this is one area that pharmaceutical companies are really uh, interested in, because at the EBI we have a big uh, expertise about. Um, chemical pathways, biological pathways, uh, and structure, pr protein structure information, chemical structure information. So they're trying to harness our resource for lots of existing data, well annotated data, in order to try and find new targets for drugs. So that is definitely one area that's, that the guys involved in. I said that's an Elixir project. Yes. Uh, 